Hello, this is Ukrainian Internet TV, and we continue our broadcasting, and our guest is Mr. Glenn Grant. He is a retired British Army colonel, security and defense expert. Mr. Grant, thank you very much for your kindly agreement to give us an interview. Thank you very much for asking me. Uh, Mr. Grant, uh, let's start from the very beginning. Uh, how you describe the situation on the battlefields? That is a good question because it's probably um, the battlefield is getting more complex uh, all the time we speak because there are more more variables coming into the into the overall battle. It was very simple at first. It was it was Ukraine versus uh, U Ukraine versus Russia, Russia versus Ukraine. But now we have to take so many more things into account, like Belarusia, like North Korea and their support, like the, the drones from uh, Iran, uh, and, and, and then what itself, the American support, the European support, even support from other countries like uh, Uganda, uh, and all these things all have an effect to how the battlefield uh, goes. In the actual war at the moment, then I think you have to look at it in, in four separate areas. The first area which I will just speak about and ignore from then on is what is happening in Belarus, because I, I think that this is uh, this is a, a bit of a, a red herring, as we say. It's not something that is fundamental to the main battlefield, but it is using people and it is tying up resources of Ukraine facing what is happening. But I don't think that the soldiers that are in Belarus, the uh, Belarusian soldiers themselves, nor the equipment and supply is good enough uh, for actually for a, a, a new attack from Belarus. That does not mean they will not do one, but I'm just saying it's not good enough. So if they do attack, I think they will get a very bloody punch in the nose from the Ukrainians that are waiting for them. Um, then in the, in, the, in, the, in the north area, uh, then we still have a lot of problems with shelling around Sumy and around uh, Kharkiv. Um, uh, but I think that we will just have to accept that for, for, for the moment because there is nothing that really that Ukraine can do if it keeps its uh, if it keeps its promise of not actually firing into Russia and doing something into Russia. So we just this this is as it is. Below Kharkiv, where the attack took place, then it was a it was a truly marvelous uh, counterattack, which uh, I don't know whether it ran out of steam or whether it was stopped or or whether the, the, we just ran into heavy enemy. It's not clear at the moment why, why it didn't keep going as quickly as it could have done, because the Russians were running away. Um, but that, that area, it, it, is, it badly needs to restart the counterattack again and keep pushing east and south, because the enemy there is not strong. Um, and and it, it is possible that the, the battle could be opened again. The door opened and pushed through. Um, below that, the, the old the old ATO area, the battle lines. I mean, they've hardly changed. Uh, Russia keeps pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. But I mean, you know, to only be in Avdika or on Bakhmut and places after so long and having lost so many soldiers is extremely bad soldiering on the part of the Russians and extremely wonderful defense on the part of the Ukrainians. Um, but, it, it, but also that area is maybe not as strong as it looks on the Russian side. Um, and, and, you know, the, the big weakness is probably uh, Donetsk itself, uh, because there is no way at the moment that Russia could defend Donetsk against Ukraine if Ukraine gets into Donetsk because they are not good enough soldiers. They will be eaten alive by, by any Ukrainian soldiers that go in there, um, especially those who've been training in, for example, in UK on how to actually to fight in built up areas. 
uh, and again, soldiers who uh, Ukrainian soldiers who have been fighting in built-up areas will do will move through Donetsk very very quickly. So Donetsk is very vulnerable that area to to Russia. Um, and then of course the south the south area with is across the south below Zaporizhny and and to Kherson. It, this is very very difficult area for for Russia because. That they've put a lot of their best soldiers into Kherson now to defend Kherson. Frankly, I would leave Kherson as it is. I would just leave it there if it was me, because because it's the other areas that they've made weak that provide the opportunity for uh, for, for Ukraine to break through either maybe south, maybe below Kherson, uh, sorry, below Zaporizhny, or even towards Mariupol. And hearing hearing that they are building strong defences at Mariupol makes me believe that the Russians think that this is going to happen. So in many ways, Russia is now vulnerable for a, a long way, all the way down from Kharkiv, all the way down to, to, to Kherson. Um, and they, they have made a judgment that the battle will be in Kherson. Uh, like in the same way that they made a judgment, you know, that, that the battle will be at the gates of Moscow. The battle will be in Leningrad. The battle will be in Stalingrad. And maybe, maybe, uh, maybe the Ukrainian general staff don't think the same. I, I I don't know, but 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 as I do say, I think that the vulnerability and the opportunity for for Ukraine is not necessarily around the Kherson region, but is in other areas. Um, now, part of that, part of that, I go back which is the availability of equipment, ammunition and weapons for Ukraine and whether they are getting enough quickly enough to make them strong enough to do a counterattack, I don't know. And it may well be that the, any delay that we see as, as people looking from the outside, that the delay is a wait whilst they collect more, more equipment, more weapons. But of course, all the time that that delay is happening, more attacks are happening into cities in and around in and around Ukraine and 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 the electricity and the power and the water are all being destroyed by 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 missiles so it's a complex battle Mr. Grant, you say about uh, the uh, soldiers, Russia soldiers, that they are not good equipped and not good trainer training. But uh, nevertheless, uh, does mobilization could change dramatically situation uh, on battlefields? I mean, mobilization in Russia. Well, only only in that it it provides Russia with a lot more dead bodies. Because the soldiers are not good. They're not soldiers. It's this is, you know, we are not fighting against Russian soldiers you mu in most places and they mustn't be called that. They are Russian civilians being sent to the front line. And, and so what does it change? It, well, it just it just means that they can throw what they call a battalion, but it's not a battalion. It's a, it's a, it's a group of civilians with no training, with no coherence, with no commander. And if they do have a commander, then remember, he's not a commander from the first part of the war. He's likely to be a commander from some regional office somewhere back in 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 uh, some part of, of Russia. So he's an alcoholic who has been doing a civilian job, calling himself a major or a captain for 20 years. And now he finds himself in charge of 100 aggressive young men who don't want to go to war. That is not a battalion or a brigade. It's civilians. Mr. Grant, um, it is very interesting question about the role of artillery in this war, because sometimes uh, we think that, for example, nuclear weapons uh, does matter or modern new weapons does matter. But in this war, we understand the, that artillery is very important. Uh, but how you, could you describe the role of uh, artillery? Well, it's, it's you have to remember that, that in Russian doctrine, that, um, that artillery has always been the main weapon, not not the infantrymen. So oh, Russian doctrine is that you use artillery and then you follow into the dead area with 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 infantry soldiers afterwards. And that is how they've always fought that way. And of course, historically, by big sweeping tank movements 
you know, they can't can't do those at the moment because they, they don't have the tanks and they don't have the training. They just they just don't have the, the radios or anything to to actually to do this. And remember that again, go back that those tank battles that they could only do those battles in the Second World War because of lend lease, not because Russia provided them with equipment. So there's no lend lease for them now. So the equipment is old, the equipment doesn't work. It's not good Russian, sorry, it's not good American and British equipment they're driving, it's old Russian equipment. So so they are stuck now using the artillery. Artillery has always been an effective weapon for Russia. They've always trained well, they've spent a lot of money on it, they have good communications and good uh, systems in the artillery, and well-trained systems, probably better than any other arm except perhaps perhaps electronic warfare so those are two arms that have always been that are, are successful and work the infantry is just men bodies and that is how they see it historically so that think of that for russia now for ukraine the problem for ukraine is that they needed to kill the artillery because if russia is going to destroy you with artillery you have to kill that so that has changed to a large degree how the Ukrainians fight, because the Ukrainians are better at infantry fighting, but they can't infantry fight if they are being killed and squashed by artillery. They, they need to engage face to face or they need to go around the back or around the side. So for, for, for Ukraine, the key is not just to kill the artillery. The key is to get behind the infantry and the artillery, because then they can't fight. Then they have to run away. And this is the fundamental thing. If you can get behind Russia, they run away because they can't use the artillery and the infantry is not is not the active, powerful arm. So you have to break the battle paradigm that Russia wants to fight you. So Russia wants to fight you in a straight line, artillery, infantry. And that is the most dangerous way for Ukraine to fight. We have to break them up somehow, even if even if it means pulling back quickly, 30 kilometers. And then coming from the side when they because they can't deal, they can't deal with coordinated battle. It means maneuvering, maneuvering war. Maneuver is, warfare. Maneuvering is, war. Yeah. The moment it goes to maneuver warfare, they are lost. They cannot do it because they don't have the officers, they don't have the radios, they don't have the intelligence. Intelligence, you need intelligence, you need bright, I don't mean intelligence information, I mean intelligence in the head. They don't have that. Their army is not an intelligent army. But but the danger is the longer that we leave them, the better they will get in some areas, the more that the intelligent people will understand how to fight. And so it's very important all the time that they must lose the initiative some way. Because every time they lose that initiative, they, they break, they collapse. Mr. Now, Grant. Yeah. It, you say, uh, and it is understandable that uh, uh, maneuvering war is much more uh, important for Ukraine, and uh, you know that we need more weapons uh, to understand how to use these weapons in different part of of the battlefields yeah. and how to to move quickly and other other things, uh, and we have a very strong and complicated situation. From the first side, we have Russia with old but huge number of weapons. Yeah. Yeah. From the other side, we have Ukraine, which is ready for maneuvering war, but we haven't enough weapons. And what what can be done in that situation? Well, how, it, it, how... It, you have to rethink this. It's only because it's not enough when you line up and say, I need to be one to one. If you actually say, right, we... We, we will accept we will accept that we're not going to fight Russia in the way Russia wants to fight that we have to try and even if it's overnight move people out from battle areas put them in t one small area and break through we have to change how this battle is done and 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 because facing them in a line you cannot beat Russia without all those extra weapons without all the extra ammunition it's it's the mind that has to be beaten to beat Russia, not 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 the, the equipment. 
because we kill people, they find someone else. We destroy ammunition, they bring more. I am not saying that the, the Ukrainian is not getting it right because the, 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 the battlefield is still being positively moved in Ukraine's, uh, in Ukraine's favor in two or three areas, but it's expensive. It's expensive, it's killing people, it's losing people, it's heavy on ammunition. When the most, the most effective is to get behind. This is all I can say. Now, how you do that, it means finding the space, finding the place to get behind. And I, in, and I would come back at this one thing, which is, I think winter is the opportunity for Ukraine. Not winter. Winter is opportunity. It is very it interesting. Is Why? Why do you think so? Because we're Why? better than they are. We're better equipped. We're more intelligent, and we're harder. As uh, Ukraine is harder as an army, and therefore, if you break them in anywhere, anywhere you break them, they are going to break. Ukraine will not break, but they will break. And winter means that they're going to be already degraded physically. They won't have the food that they need. They won't have the, the clothing that they need. They won't have the leadership that they need. They won't have they won't have anything that they need to support them in winter. So they will break. But if you let them fire artillery, they have the initiative. So it's finding a point and then pushing through it as hard as possible. And in the winter, when it's down with snow, even soldiers walking if they can break through, Russia will run away. Russians will run away. Uh, Mr. Grant, we expected here in Kiev more and more weapons from our Western partners. And uh, we constantly say it is not enough. It's not enough. And maybe it's true. Maybe it's not enough. Uh, uh, why do you think um, it's not, it is very slow? slow uh, the process uh, of uh, putting um, the process of um, uh, giving weapons for ukraine is so it's, slow. it's a good it's a good question um and i'm not necessarily sure that it's true um I, I can ask you how many weapons has how many weapons has has ukrombrom prom produced very good question i agree okay. with you so let's balance ukrombrom prom and ask ask you know husiev why is it taking time to do this? And he will give you an answer. And the answer, the answer will probably be quite sensible, that it takes time to do this, it takes time to test something, it takes time to bring something. Remember that the majority of countries are not going to give you their main equipment, their army equipment, okay? They're going to give you what is in store. They're going to give you what they're not using, what is second line equipment. Maybe some of them, like Czech Republic, will give you their best equipment, as long as someone gives them back immediately equipment that they can use because they don't want to be empty of equipment in case this war goes wrong. So, so you have to wait for new equipment to come in to replace the old equipment. Much of the old equipment that Eastern European states had, not America, but around the Eastern European, much of that equipment was old and tired. And so some of it, like I think the tanks from Poland, had to be renovated first. So they actually had to have, and some of them needed new sites, they needed new new surveillance equipment, new radios, it doesn't matter, but they needed renovation. So it's not a quick movement. Equipment from America, first of all, it has to be found, has to be agreed that this is the right equipment. Then it has to be maintained bought up to scratch because America does not want to give you equipment that will break straight away. So, and having done that, then it has to be transported and America is not next door. Okay, big equipment has to come by ship. Mm -hmm. Okay, then having got here, it's got to be got to, to Poland, then it's got to be picked up by the general staff, it's got to be put on a train, it's got to be taken across. Frankly, some of the things have been done unbelievably quickly, not slowly, but unbelievably quickly. It, you know, the quality of movement and the quality of, of action has been has been uh, as good as it's possible to be. 
So it's not necessarily slow. And remember, there's a lot of equipment that you don't know about and that you haven't seen that has come and has gone to the front line straight away. So when you when people say we're not getting enough, no, of course you're not getting enough because how big is the Ukrainian army? It's rather large at the moment. How much equipment does it need? Massive amounts. How much ammunition does it need? Well, I believe it's already fired a million rounds. Now, that is a lot of ammunition. It's a lot of ammunition for people to give you and to come out of other people's stores, especially because, remember this, that the West has been reducing budgets since 1990, since the Cold War ended. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, you, Latvia went down to something like 0.6 or 0.7% spent on the defence budget, spent on military, nothing, just enough to pay the wages. Even America at times has dropped, has dropped the budget. And remember also that for countries like America, the budget may be going up, but the cost of everything is going up because the complexity of everything is going up. You know, the, the, the ammunition that you've been given, the direct fire, the, the ammunition with ra radars in the head of the or GPS in that they are ex extremely expensive. So the old days, you know, Russian type ammunition versus one of those, it's like 30 rounds of Russian ammunition for one of the other type. So all these things, you add them together and it seems as if everything is slow. It's not. They're doing, It's a lot of it is coming as quickly as it's possible for people to give it to you with some political constraints from some countries that have been slow in delivering, and we know Germany, mm -hmm. France, almost nothing from either of them, although they talk a good game. Bulgaria has just finally made a decision to, to, to do something. So that's the way it is. That's the way the way of the world. Mr. Grant, after eight months it is clear that Ukrainians are not afraid of Putin and his army, but uh, some Ukrainians are really concerned that our Western partners will stop to support us. Is it possible? What do you think? For, for any reason. We understand that uh, um, every country has different reasons. I think this is, this is politics. I mean, uh, uh, there is a chance that some countries might do so because politics change. But uh, across... The majority of Europe, I don't see anything, uh, any any reason why anybody would stop. I mean, even 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 fluffy France uh, will still still understands really that, that, you know, this is a serious war. And there are lots of people inside France telling Macron that he's not doing enough and that he's made a serious mistake in not supporting Ukraine properly. So I don't see that that happening in, in a hurry. But I think that the argument is not always made clear that, that when they're not supporting Ukraine, they're supporting themselves. Because if the Ukraine war breaks, then it's everybody else that's suffering. And Putin is already attacking other countries. I mean, you know, the, 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 how many how many spies has, has Norway picked up in the last few weeks? Six people flying drones over Norwegian facilities, broken broken uh, communication wires, uh, communication links in the in the sea. Um, damage in Britain, damage in Denmark, damage in Germany. I mean, Putin is attacking the West and it needs, these people need to be told. Also, they need to be told that, you know, after the war, there will be reconstruction. And those countries that are supporting Ukraine will get the contracts for the reconstruction. No question. I don't see, you know, I see if a French company comes in for reconstruction, uh, with, with you know, against a Czech company, I know which one is going to get it from the Ukrainian government. It's going to go to the Czech Republic or Latvia or Estonia. It's not going to go to France because they've not done their part. They've not played their part. So I think that, you know, people need to understand that. One could take it one level level further, which is that don't forget that if we lose Ukraine, China feels it will have a free hand and Taiwan. And the moment that happens, you're also talking about damage to uh, to Chile, who has a long, uh, a long communications chain 
of getting things from Asia and from China. So all of a sudden, this th that will rebound into whole different ways and areas. Um, the economics, all those countries that are working with China, the economics is going to be bounce in, in, in ways that people are not actually thinking about very hard at the moment. And they will bounce badly. So. Mr. Okay. Grant, uh, if we speak about the future of, of the war, do you think that Putin is beating on time? Uh, does he believe that protracted war is good for him? Yes, Why? almost certainly. Why? 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 Well, because he's got huge resources hidden away. I mean, the main resources, he's got, you know, he's got 15, 20 million people he can send to the front line to die, and he doesn't care. So you, you can talk about that. He's got probably the opportunity to get a lot of his equipment back from um, uh, from North Korea. And maybe, maybe at the moment, dodgy though it sounds, maybe even India. Um, and maybe even in India? Even in India? India? Well, because India's got a huge amount of Soviet equipment and Russian equipment. And it, he may be able to trade oil for equipment with India. Um, so because, you know, India is, is not is not playing like a democracy should do at the moment. So so there are whole the whole areas like that where I think he thinks he's now got time to 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 to, to re-energize his defense industry to act, to work out what he's going to do. And I don't think he thinks he's losing. I think he thinks that, you know, the West is fracturing because France and Germany are not doing their bit. Fred Macron continues to go and talk to, to Putin. Macron thinks that he's doing this for the benefit of keeping diplomacy open. Putin thinks it's because he's a weak idiot. You know, so that they don't know <laughs> the two sides. So Putin sees all these things for, for us. We see them as democratic politics. You know, the arguments that go on. He sees them as the West breaking because he doesn't understand democratic politics. He doesn't understand we argue with each other and we'll argue and we'll give Germany a hard time, but we still expect them to deliver eventually. Um, so he thinks he's winning. He wants delay. He wants a ceasefire. He wants a, 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 he wants a, a, a winter of defence. We must not give him the opportunity. It's very important things not give him opportunity. How we could do this? Well, firstly, the, 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 the Ukraine must not go into defence during the winter. Ukraine must use the winter to attack attack militarily. And I think that the West would expect that as well. So the, the, the battle has got to keep going and we have to use the cold and the nastiness to our advantage, just as the Finns did in the Winter War. We've got to fight nasty in the winter. And, and, and that, means, that means better training. It means thinking differently about organizations and equipment and and how we what we ask the west for and and how we actually you know maybe reshape the battle reshape where the equipment is so the equipment that's best in the winter is on the point of the battlefield where it can be used best and i i am sure that the general staff are already working their brain towards this but politically we must leave him we must leave him unsettled he must not be allowed to do this. This also means the sanctions have got to be enforced. I mean, I've just seen a video 15 minutes before I spoke to you showing that in the in the um, Iranian drones, there are a lot of parts from America, from other countries. So the sanctions, so, so we need the FBI and we need the, the security services of these other countries to hunt down what, who is breaking sanctions and to break those companies and those people. We need to also to break the, 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 the to break all the sanctions busters across across the world. They've got to be hit hard so that Russia gets no opportunity during this winter to, to replenish anything from ball bearings to to food to to car parts, anything. IT chips, computers, He's got to be hit really hard with that. That's how we beat him. Does it mean that we need uh, to attack this winter and we need to gather all possible weapons and just to to go forward? Uh, it, it, is it uh, vital for Ukraine? 
to yes, go forward yes, and is. to make a tactical decision. It is, because if we don't, he will use the time to create better defences where he needs them, and he'll he'll train people. And if every every soldier that he trains, every person that he trains to become a soldier, is a possible killer on his side. Whilst we've got whilst we've got res, uh, mobilised reservists who are civilians, it is to the strength the strength of Ukraine. We're fighting civilians. That's good. We need we need Russia to keep putting civilians in the front line because they can't fight properly. But give them time and every week or two weeks or three weeks that you give them, they will get better. Also, whilst they're deployed in the front line in the cold weather, they are going to get very, very unhappy. We have to make them more unhappy. Mr. Grant, uh, many uh, foreign military experts uh, say uh, very optimistic uh, about the end of the war. Uh, and they say that it would happen in spring or in summer. But here in Ukraine, we have a, a little bit another understanding of situation. What What is your expectation about the future um, of this war? Uh, is it possible to to win this war quickly? I mean, in spring it's or a, in summer? It's a good question, dear. It's a really good question. And I think that it, it, it depends upon an awful lot of other things. Uh, it depends a lot of, of, upon politics. Uh, and I mean, for example, if the if the uh, if the current situation in Iran changes and and the government falls, then all of a sudden we're in a different battlefield area. Um, if China decides that you know that Russia is losing and then puts pressure on North Korea not to support, that's another thing. Um, if the American uh, uh, Republicans suddenly become much, much stronger and they decide not to support Ukraine, that could be another thing. Although although I don't think that that will happen. But but it's a possibility. And so you, you can say that, that uh, there are nine or ten variables in this in this war outside of outside of Russia and outside of Ukraine. That If three or four of them went the positive way of Ukraine, the war could finish much more quickly. If three or four of them went to the way of Russia, the war could drag on for a long, a lot, lot longer. And so it's all those variables, including the variable of the health of Putin. You know, all of those variables, and, and therefore it's too, it's too complex to call at the moment. I mean, the one thing I do say is that the, the The Russian army is completely vulnerable at the moment. I mean, it is weak, it's frightened, it knows it's losing. And so anything that we do now is going to speed the, the, the end of the war. Any delay on Ukraine's part, either for lack of confidence or for anything else, will increase the length of the war. Because we need to catch that vulnerability of those mobilized civilians and 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 just drive into them as hard as possible, so they break. Mr. Grant, you say that the, uh, China is an important factor of, mm. of this war. What do you think about the role of China, uh, which is which China plays right now or could play in, in nearest time? Could play in nearest time. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that when the war started, China was, you know, very positive pro pro Russia. And I think that it thought like, probably even thought like Russia, and possibly because Putin told them beforehand that we will be through there in three days. Uh, and then suddenly China took a, a, a took a, a serious think about this. And I think that if there is anybody with a brain in China, they're going to be wondering themselves, you know, if this is what Russia is like, what what what? And we've been going there doing our training with them, and we think that they we thought they were, you know, quite good. What is our army like? You know what are what are what are what is the equipment we've got from Russia like? Well, I mean now they know it's rubbish, and and they will be thinking hard about the whole of their defense system. I would guess, but you never know with these things because you know, this is also a similar country where people don't tell the truth to their leaders, and so in a lot of cases they may be full of generals like the Russian generals saying we can do this, we can't do this. Um, well, we can do this, yes, of course, and of course it's not true. 
and China w w may be in exactly the same situation. So good on paper, good at parades, uh, good at looking good when they're doing something, they understand what they're doing, but not so good when they've actually got to do something a bit different. Um, what is their role at the moment? Well, it, I think it's changing. I mean, I think that China as a country understands full well that their money is linked, their, their, their economic health is linked to the USA. That if they go, if they, if they, if that breaks, then China's economics break. And I don't think that they're clever enough to, to, to withstand the shock of a break from America. America is because it's sharp. It's got different business. It will just re, re line itself up somewhere else if it's not working with China. But I don't think China, China doesn't have the, the it doesn't have the language for starters. It doesn't have English. So, you know, they, they will find it extremely difficult to reopen markets everywhere. They're not trusted. The trust is going down heavily since their position in the war. Um, so they will find it much, much more difficult to open new markets than America would, because American businessmen are used to opening new markets uh, uh, and would do so quite quickly. So China is in a quandary at the moment. It's in a difficult position. If it supports Russia, it loses a lot of other things. If it doesn't support Russia, it loses probably the only friend it's got of any sense in the world. Very hard for them. Mr. Grant, uh, do you believe that uh, Putin could use nuclear weapons? I don't believe he will because he's not used them so far. There have been lots of times on the way through to now that he could have used nuclear weapons because, it, you know, just cause, especially after the, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, Russian loss around Kiev. Um, you know, then, then that would have been a good opportunity to stick a, a, a tactical nuclear weapon on somewhere. And I don't think that whatever they talk about, um, that, that his close group of people and the, and the senior military want to die. And I think that they, that, you know, the one area where they probably respect America is in the nuclear field. And th they know that America has a huge capacity, you know, with the bombers, with the nuclear submarines, with everything else. They know that backing them up, both France and Britain have both got nuclear weapons. Although Macron has said he wouldn't use his, which is the most stupid thing that anybody can do, because then it means it, he, he doesn't have it anymore, in effect. Um, but but he hasn't done so so far. Nobody wants to die. So I think that it would be a really, really last ditch part on Putin for him to ask them to do it. And then I think that many of them would refuse. They like going on holiday to France, to southern France. <laughs> uh, Mr. Grant, and uh, last uh, question, uh, it is about the security, uh, maybe in general uh, security in, in Europe and in the world, if you want. Uh, if we speak about the uh, position of our Western partners towards Russia, uh, it is a very important question because uh, what is the goal of this war? Uh, have our Western partners? Because it is very important how they understand the future yeah. of Russia in this architecture of uh, European is, security. Is it does it does it matter? Really? Well, it does, but I'm not sure most of them have even thought about it. I think they're just I think they're just going uh, about trying to actually get the war finished without actually thinking beyond that. Um, I mean, if you look at the security art architecture, then so far, NATO has been unbelievably successful. Right and, now. Right, right now. now yeah. I can't argue with it. With I mean, Putin has not dared to attack a NATO country. Seriously. I mean, hybrid warfare, things that he can say, well, it's not us, like <laughs> Like blowing up his own pipeline, you know, and trying to actually to say that, that you know, nothing to do with us. This is to do with someone else, America, Britain or whatever. But he hasn't actually done any frontal attack or any direct attack on a NATO country. Um, and uh, so that 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 shows the strength of what NATO's done. 
I think that after the war, there will be some hard discussions in in the West. And when by the West, I, I also include uh, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Taiwan, uh, South Korea, about, you know, what is this security architecture that we've got? Uh, what works and what doesn't work? And what should we change in future? Uh, and I, I think it's, you know, you can call it NATO and partners, um, but 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 there are a lot of going to be a lot of very senior people in these countries who are saying, you know, did we get this right? Well, we didn't because Russia attacked Ukraine, so we didn't get it right before the war. Uh, what, what what did we do wrong after Georgia? What should we have done with Georgia? What should we have done before Ukraine? What should we have done, and why did we mess that up? And of course, there'll be big questions. What do we do with Ukraine? Do we let Ukraine into NATO? Um, and there's going to be some serious, and this is, I'm sorry, but this is another complete program of, of you know, how people in the West feel about Ukraine and, 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 and what, what, what signals they see coming from Ukraine, uh, you know, and this, and I'm going to say this complete difference in culture between the, the government of Ukraine and the society of Ukraine. And, and, and the, you know, the, the cultural difference is huge. Um, and and, and the, the, so I see a lot of a lot of things in the future are going to have to be discussed, but they can't be discussed at the moment. So, you know, what does the West want from this? It wants it finished so that the future can be discussed. Now, will the West get time to discuss the future properly? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that we won't just roll from one problem to the next. And that, you know, when they say when you unleash the dogs of war, you don't know what's going to happen. And I think we are in that position right at the moment. The dogs of war have been unleashed. There are now an increasing number of variables in all this. And I'm not sure that we can be sure that there's going to be a smooth ending to this at all. Mr. Grant, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your kind agreement to give us an interview. Thank you. Not at all. Thank you. Thank you. Glenn Grant was uh, our guest today and we're proud of this situation. Thank you very much and see you later. It, it was a Thank you.